He's like, I have to jump in the shower. I've been doing crystal meth all weekend. You're welcome to join. I'm like, ew, disgusting. I don't shower with people. I'll just be out here waiting for that AIDS dick. Welcome to This Is Not Happening. I'm your host, Roy Wood Jr. Think about your best friend, your spouse, your partner. You spend enough time with anybody, they are going to annoy you. They'll never truly get you. Which is why I came up with a solution. You're my soulmate, this bro. This is my favorite video game. Are you my friend and my daddy? No, 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 not yet. No, 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 no. A pee pee. This next gentleman I'm bringing to the stage, you know him from his podcast, The Infodales, Thomas Dale. I'm the type of person that I believe that every situation in our life brings us to the next situation and then ultimately brings us to where we belong. Or at least that's what I keep telling myself to survive this fucking life. <laughs> Before I started stand-up, I just wanted to be a boyfriend. I loved love. Oh yeah, I was quite basic. <laughs> I used to walk around listening to the Backstreet Boys show me the meaning of being lonely. That was my shit. I was 19 years old, I was living in LA. I was dating this guy. Well, I thought we were dating, but apparently he was just eating my ass. <laughs> It broke my heart, so I went out to get drunk. I'm at this bar, this hot 40-year-old bartender was just like feeding me free drinks. Ah, I felt so beautiful. Then he tells me he wants to take me back to his place. So I'm like, sure, I mean, we're obviously getting married. Let's do it. <laughs> Where else would we go? We're in his truck, we're on the way back to his place. He bought me a rose. Well, I had a rose, I took it from someone maybe. I don't know, I had a fucking rose. <laughs> As we're driving back to his place, he says, I have to tell you something, I'm HIV positive. Yeah, I'm a hypochondriac. Like, if someone farts, I won't breathe for 10 seconds because I'm afraid I'm gonna get feces in my nose. And I'm a huge narcissist, so like in my head, I was like, oh my God, I have to have sex with him because he was honest and if I deny him, he's gonna turn vengeful and just start fucking everybody raw and never tell anybody ever again and give the whole world AIDS. I have to save the world. <laughs> I have to fuck him. And I was a virgin, so I had no desire to have sex. We get back to his place. He's like, I have to jump in the shower. I've been doing crystal meth all weekend. <laughs> You're welcome to join. I'm like, ew, disgusting. I don't shower with people. I'll just be out here waiting for that AIDS dick. <laughs> So he gets out of the shower, I'm on the bed on all fours, like a birthday pony. He puts a condom on, he comes over, he greases me up like a breakfast skillet. And he starts jabbing. Now I'm a virgin, so I was tight as fuck. Like it was not going in, it was not even the tip. Like it was so, it was not happening. Like I swear an angel was holding my asshole shut. He's like, buddy, we don't have to do this. It's not happening. Let's just go to sleep. So we go to bed. We never have sex. We don't do anything. The next day, he brings me back to my apartment. Uh, he says, oh, wait, when as I'm getting out of the truck, don't forget this. And he hands me the red rose, which is now dying at this point. And my rising's Aquarius, so I overanalyze everything. So I'm holding this dead red rose. I was like, oh, my God, I have AIDS. <laughs> the petals are falling. It was very Beauty and the Beast. I was like, this is it. I'm like, I have to move back to New York and spend my last days with my family. So I move back to New York. <laughs> Hypochondria in full flare. For a year, I was so convinced that I was a virgin man living with AIDS. Like, I was like, if the Mother Mary could get a baby without sex, I could get AIDS. It's the Immaculate AIDS, you know? <laughs> 
the whole year, I'm paranoid. Every time I got a chill, I was like, oh, it's happening. Everybody come say your goodbyes. Tell me all the wonderful things you love about me. Like when we would smoke weed, me and my friends, I was like, roll me a separate blunt. Cause you know, the AIDS. <laughs> my best friend eventually was like, I'm so tired of hearing about your fake fucking AIDS. Go get fucking tested already. I went and got tested, I was negative. The nurse hands me a bunch of condoms. I was like, get those out of here. I'm never having sex again. She's like, you didn't have sex the first time, hun. Cut it out. <laughs> so that night I was so excited. I was like, oh, I have to get a celebratory bag of weed, right? So I go out, I get a bag of weed. It was a new dealer. I get to the house, out comes Ricky. Blue eyes, blonde hair, Macaulay Culkin lips. <gasps> I was in love and he was in the closet, so I had some fucking work to do. <laughs> Every night we would meet, I would buy weed from him, we would sit in my car and we would talk. One night, January 23rd, 2003, 10.47 p.m., we both reached for the radio to change the station and our hands touched and they lingered and he was shivering because he'd never been with a guy before. He was so nervous. So I just held his hand really tight and soft and waited till he calmed down and then we just both leaned in and kissed. And it was true love. It was so beautiful, I never wanted to let him go. Because when I love, I don't let go. <laughs> when I love, there's gonna be a restraining order put in place. <laughs> we dated for three and a half years, I even lost my virginity to him. And he just started like lying to me a lot. And instead of breaking up with him, I went to a psychiatrist and she gave me antidepressants and anti-anxiety pills and sleeping pills, you know, the works. <laughs> so one night he's giving me the runaround. He's telling me, I'm on my way home from the bar. I'm on my way, I'll be, I'll be home in a little bit. But my moon is in Pisces so I could feel the truth. <laughs> like this motherfucker's lying to me. <laughs> he's in his bedroom fucking somebody, I know it. So now I'm outside his house, in my car, 2 a.m., like an actual psychopath. I'm like, I gotta get in that fucking room. So I'm banging on his front door like Karen from Goodfellas. Janet Ross, he's a whore! You got a whore living in your building! His mom answers the door in her bathrobe, all crusty-eyed, she just came out of bed. She's like, hey, Thomas, Ricky's not home right now. Oh. This bitch is in on it. <laughs> That's okay. I just need my sleeping pills and they're in his room and I can't sleep without them. I'm sorry, honey. Ricky's not home and his door is locked. Oh, this bitch thought of everything. I'm like, I'm Italian, honey. You think a locked door is gonna stop me? You got a butter knife? And she was cool mom, right? So cool mom got me that butter knife. Cause only cool mom is okay with her newly gay son's lunatic boyfriend asking for a butter knife to break into his room at 2 a.m. for his fucking meds. So I'm trying to wedge into this room, unlock it with the butter knife. I'm yelling into the door because I'm convinced that he's fucking somebody in there. I'm like, I know you're in there. Open this goddamn door. I can smell your cologne. Obsession for men, I bought it for you last Christmas. And I could smell his clone because he was standing behind me the whole fucking time. He's like, Thomas, what are you doing? I was like, ah! And I forgot what I was doing. And his mom's like, oh, Jesus Christ, fucking homos. Wrap it up. <laughs> he needs his sleeping pills, Rick. I was like, oh, yeah, that's it, my pills. Oh, I'm exhausted. I haven't slept for days. So Ricky gets me my pills. He gives me my pills. He's like, get out of here. It's over. I never want to see you again. I'm with the butter knife. Why? <laughs> for this? Yes, it's done. So I go home, I'm in my room, the crazy starts wearing off, and I start realizing what I did. I'm like, holy shit, I fucked it all up. I'll never get him back. There's no recovering from but a knife. Like, <laughs> it's done. I go, I have to do something to show him how much I love him. And we had just rented Romeo and Juliet from Blockbuster. So I was like, oh, I have a great idea. I'll kill myself. <laughs> So I take all the sleeping pills. I even slept like this. <laughs> Next day I wake up, I'm like, how the fuck am I still alive right now? I'm trying to prove my love. So I remembered my best friend had sleeping pills. So I call her up and I try to put on sane voice, which apparently I think is a black woman from the South. I'm like, hey girl, you got them sleeping pills? 
me and Ricky been fighting all night and I need to get some rest. So she comes over with the pills and she hands me the bottle thinking that I'm just gonna take a couple and go to bed. But she doesn't realize that I'm Claire Danes professing my love. So I take the whole bottle. She's mortified. She runs downstairs to tell my parents to call for help. I run to my sister's room. I start taking her codeines. My, my, my sister's like, what the fuck are you doing? I'm like, I'm proving love, shut the fuck up. My parents come upstairs, my dad runs in the room, I punch my dad, my dad tackles me to the ground, my mom is in the, in the hallway, she's screaming and yelling, and when she gets very nervous, she gets like an Italian accent out of nowhere. She's really from Brooklyn, but she's like, Tommy, no! <laughs> Tommy, why, why are you doing this, Tommy, please! I'm like, I'm in love! She's like, what are the neighbors gonna think? I'm like, I just ate a hundred sleeping pills. You think I'd give a shit what Tony and fucking Rosa think? <laughs> the cops come in, they're dragging me through the house. I'm screaming, you fucking pigs. What is this, your big fucking break? You got nothing else to fucking do, you fucking pigs? I elbow them in the face. I dive head first down the basement stairs because I'm like, apparently these pills ain't nothing but a bitch. <laughs> I'm down at the bottom of the stairs, screaming like the exorcist, Ricky! Ricky! The cops come down, they handcuff my ankles, they drag me out into the driveway. I'm still yelling at them, I'm calling them bacon, egg, and cheeses. I don't know what the fuck that means. They throw me on a stretcher, they put me in the ambulance, my dad jumps in the front seat, and we're off to the ER. We get to the ER, and I see my dad talking to the doctor and the doctor's like giving my dad prescriptions to take me home and sedate me. And I'm yelling across over the receptionist, hey doctor, give me the scripts, I'll cash them in. Don't worry, I'm fine. The receptionist looks up from what she's writing and very sweetly, she wanted to help. She goes, shh, they're gonna commit you. <laughs> So I lean down and I grab her pencil. I said, oh yeah? Commit this, bitch. And I jab myself in the throat. <laughs> Very Pulp Fiction. <laughs> Except it wasn't even a sharp fucking pencil. It was a dull pencil. So it's just bouncing off my fucking neck. I'm like, I'm relentlessly resilient! <laughs> Orderlies jump on me. They pour this yellow liquid down my throat. They throw me on a stretcher. I don't know where all these fucking stretchers kept coming from. <laughs> and they knock me out. I wake up hours later in a cold, dark room, a nurse sitting at the door watching me. And I look over at her and I said, what happened? What am I doing here? Where am I? And she said, 5150, they had to commit you. You tried to kill yourself. And I look down and I'm wearing a straight jacket. Very fucking tacky. <laughs> And I thought to myself, oh my God, I would have been better off staying with the guy with fucking AIDS. <laughs> so I always try to find a silver lining to everything. And I realized that I found myself in the ambulance. We were in the ambulance and I was laying on the stretcher and I had just finished cursing everybody out and I'm laying there and the nurse said to me, she said, honey, why did you do this? And I just started crying. And I said to her, I hate being gay because being gay in an Italian family is an embarrassment and my family would be better off without me. And I finally found somebody that I loved and he truly loved me back and I messed it all up and I'll never find anybody to love like that again. And my dad said in the front seat, he can only hear what was going on. And we went in and I was cursing and screaming and insulting everybody. And then minutes later, he just heard everybody laughing and having a good time. I was killing in the ambulance. <laughs> Except myself. <laughs> so I got out, I broke up with Ricky, and that was 10 years ago. And I started stand-up comedy then. Stand-up saved my life, and I finally found my true love. Thank you very much, guys. Thomas Dale, everybody!